Thanks, Pastor Brandon. Love you, brother. Love what God is doing here at the Rock of Roseville. Um, I've been able to be with you all, like at least for the student camps for some years. But this is the first time uh, that I've been able to join you on a Sunday morning. Let me say, it feels like home. Presence of God, uh, just happy people full of joy and righteousness and peace and the Holy Spirit. And I'm just so thankful to be here. I'm kind of a little bit of a mess this morning because I'm really celebrating a breakthrough uh, storyline that's happening in my hometown with our ministry team back in Nashville. And I just want to celebrate what God is doing uh, this morning. Um, but it was about August, actually last spring, that a man in our, ministry, our, man in our church came to me and gave, gave me a word. And he says, Adam, I've been praying for your ministry. And he says, I really feel like God's saying he wants to give you a new 22. I'm like, man, I'm from Salinas, California. I don't like guns, man. I'm not familiar with the drive-bys. And he's like, no, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a gun. It's new 22-year-olds and 20-year-olds who, who God wants to give you as, a, as new team members to help you reach high schools and college campuses in our region. And I'm like, yes, Lord. In recent season, after moving to Nashville, my heart had been turned toward, especially uh, high school campuses and college campuses in, our, in Middle Tennessee, and sure enough, I spoke at a, a group of gathering of college students a couple months later. This was back in August. And after I did two evangelism training sessions, two young people came to me, a 20-year-old and a 22-year-old. And they sat me down. These are two just young, great, fiery, uh, emerging evangelists. And they said, Adam, the whole time you were speaking, we've just felt compelled by God. And we're supposed to tell you, we want to partner with you. Can we team together for evangelistic initiatives in our city, in our region? They're like, will you be like the dad of what we're doing? And I'm like, I'm an old guy now. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, sure, you know. And uh, so in the course of time, a couple of weeks, we caught wind of this thing that was happening in our community, this trend in Williamson County where we're at in Franklin, just south of Nashville. And we're a young junior in high school was approached by his dad who said, I'll give you a $3,000 son to start a business, but you got to pay me back. And the son said, all right. And so he starts a rave business, a rave. He books a venue, a DJ, sound equipment, the fog machine, the whole bit, books a, you know, an emerging artist, which isn't hard to do in Nashville. He sells tickets online and 400 students show up. Homeboy starts making dough, you know. So he starts hosting these raves, and we all know what kind of stuff happens at raves, and it's not often like God-fearing, pleasing things. And so we hear about these young students, a, a, now a senior, two seniors in high school who are doing this, and these young guys that I'm coaching and mentoring, these wild-eyed 20 and 22-year-olds, they get an idea, and they say, what if God's given him influence and it's supposed to be for the kingdom? And so they come to me and they say, we found out where he lives. And I'm like... <laughs> That's creepy. <laughs> but you go. I'm praying for you, you know. So we prayed, and we prayed in advance for this breakthrough meeting. God, let this be a, a God encounter. And they show up and knock on his door. They have a sit down face to face with him. And they build a friendship with him. They start meeting with him literally every week for the next two and a half months. They're discipling him unto conversion. And he goes from being a pothead, nominal, Bible belt, Jesus believer to one who wants to be a full disciple of Jesus. And then the challenge came. God's given you influence in your generation. We want to see you use it for eternal good. And then the idea came. Let's partner together on your next rave. Let's make it a Jesus rave. Let's go from the rave to the save. Give us 20 minutes to preach the gospel at the end of your next rave. The dude prays about it, new disciple, and he says, I want to, we want to do it. And so this, this all happened in the last couple months. And so next thing you know, we're, we're creating a plan together, a follow-up plan. And we devised this text-in plan to, like, encourage students to come to our next worship event. But then sending them two-minute videos over the next few weeks of discipleship truths after they come to the, to the Lord. There, there's all things that kind of I had a part in. I'm, I'm networking with youth pastors to kind of be a bridge to, from the rave to local churches. And uh, the next thing you know, we get called into a meeting with a group in the downtown Nashville called Rocket Town, which is a famous venue in the heart of downtown Nashville that Michael W. Smith started. 
and so Rocket Town contacts us. They sit down with us, uh, our team, these young guys, and they say, uh, you're doing what we want to do. We want in. Can we partner with you? Would you move your rave to downtown Nashville? We'll give you our venue. We'll pay for the staff. We will promote it to every student in the greater Nashville area that's in our database. We want to see kids swept into the kingdom of heaven. All of a sudden, the rave got amplified. So the rave just happened last night. I'd already committed to being here. That's how much I love you, Pastor Ryan Murphy. <laughs> the rave happened last night, and I started getting email after email right before I was um, scheduled to speak with college students. It was bing, 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 bing. I look at my phone, over 100 text-ins already just of people responding to the gospel. Come on. From the rave to the safe. Can we celebrate what God's doing? I just want to point you to one resource before I teach today. New Identity, 30 Days of Prayer for Spiritual Transformation. I wrote this. I, we wrote, released this last year on 11-11, and it actually came on the heels of a dream, the first dream I received after moving to Nashville. And God spoke to me three things through the dream. One, there's an imminent harvest reserve, a harvest of souls, especially for ministries that are dedicated to reaching the next generation. And I said, yes, Lord. And then the Lord said, uh, in your harvesting, it's so important. You don't ne neglect the dirty work of discipleship. And then the third thing that God said is he said that the topic of spiritual identity would be a prophetic key that would unlock the discipleship journey of the next generation. So I wrote a book, a new resource for a new harvest on the topic of spiritual identity. You can get your hands on that in the back there. It was so cool because the Lord used Lou Engle in the dream, a man that I didn't, I don't have a, I didn't have a relationship with. And then a year later, I'm in a meeting with Lou and about 24 leaders from around Nashville. And Lou calls me out in the meeting, you know. <laughs> You. And he prophesies over me about gathering young people and being used as an evangelist and a, and a mobilizer. And then, he, and then he comes to me after the meeting. He's like, I'm just so drawn to you and your 22-year-old friend. And he's like, uh, Adam, the last thing I want you to know is I just feel, you, got, you, know, you know how he is. <laughs> identity is the key to the heart of the next generation, the message of identity. And I'm like, I know. I was so wrecked by that, I forgot to tell him I wrote this book, you know, and so, <laughs> Lou, if you're watching this, just kidding. All right. <clears throat> well, this morning, I want to unpack an identity truth that I think is foundational to inspiring evangelistic gospel movement in the heart of Christians today. I believe that if we are to receive our identity from Scripture, it actually informs our ministry and missional engagement on earth today. So many Christians are asking, what am I supposed to do, God? What's my mission assignment? But, it's, but, but the gospel answers a different question. The gospel primarily answers the question of your identity. Who am I? And there's so much confusion in culture today around the topic of identity. Say amen if you know what I'm talking about. And part of the confusion revolves around the reality that the lie of cultures that culture is presenting today is identity can be chosen based on our own desires, likes, and the lust of our flesh. When in the kingdom of God, according to the gospel, identity is not that which we choose, but that which we receive. And there is so much freedom in letting the one who created you define you. The identity truth that I want to speak, I want to share on this morning that I believe is it's intentionally in the heart of God to use in our lives to inspire gospel movement is this truth that we are Christ's ambassadors. We are Christ's ambassadors. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 to 21 in a minute here. But what is an ambassador? By simple definition, an ambassador is the highest ranking diplomat of heaven on earth, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 of a nation in a foreign land. The highest ranking diplomat of a nation in a foreign land. They've been entrusted with authority and jurisdiction to represent their head of state in a different territory where they reside. What does this say about you and me? If you're here and you're in Christ, you're indwelt by the Spirit, you're born again, you've made Jesus Lord. What is Paul saying as we look into Scripture? He is saying, you are the highest ranking diplomat of heaven on earth. You've been entrusted with power and authority and a, a message of reconciliation and the wealth of God's love to represent the interests of King Jesus, the King of heaven on earth today. You are Christ's 
ambassadors. Say amen, someone. Let's look at this scripture here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 to 21. It says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. Praise God. And he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He says, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that In him, we might become the righteousness of God. Father, open your word to our hearts this morning and our hearts to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. The beautiful thing about this truth about being an ambassador of Jesus is it's not only an invitation to let the spirit of God shape you and transform you into the image of Christ in the realm of spiritual formation to where your character looks more and more like Jesus' character. But instead, it's also a catalyst, a catalytic truth for inspiring gospel mission, for partnering with God in his reach for people who are far from him. As an equipping evangelist, one of the ways I love defining evangelism is God's pursuit of people who are far from him. When evangelism starts with God instead of you and me, all of a sudden we're relieved of striving performance. We're relieved, of, uh, we're relieved of religious striving performance because we understand that God is the one who is in hot pursuit of the world around you. I've got good news for you, friend. God is in hot pursuit of your friends and family around you who are far from him. And he's invited you into holy partnership with him to see them rescued from a path of destruction. You are Christ's ambassador. Years ago, I was leading a ministry team, and we were doing a conference in another state, and um, it was a group of college students that I was le- uh, leading, and I, instead of hanging out by the pool on that afternoon, uh, it was a Friday before everything started, I said, let's go do an outreach, and we began to pray, God, where do you want us to go and post up, and God put a specific high school on our heart, and so we went and posted up like a block away at the nearest McDonald's. How many of you know when that bell rang at 2.40 p.m., there's about 349 young people that begin to light up that extra value meal menu? 200 people come through, students, McDonald's makes a total of $22.92. You know, it's just it, it gets hit up. And so we go out there and we post up, our team, six of us, and then the bell rings and all of a sudden you see hundreds of students walking our way and we're like, oh, it's on. <laughs> you know, Christ ambassadors, here we go. You know, I'm like, well, Lord, what are we going to do? I don't know. And the first, the first dude that walks up to me wasn't a student. I found out later that he was a drug dealer. I found out later a bit more about his life. I began to engage him um, in conversation. We invited him. I said, man, do you believe God's real today? He said, I don't know. I said, well, do you think that if God is real, that he could speak to a perfect stranger the secrets of your heart? He says, uh, I guess, man. I'm like, well, can we demonstrate that for you right now? So I called my young people around. We bowed our heads. We said, Jesus, we bless this brother. We know that you love him. We know that you've made him for your glory. Even though he might be far from you, would you show us some of the ways you've designed him uniquely for your glory? And all of a sudden, God begins to speak. And the prophetic spirit begins to be released. And the secrets of this young man's heart about how God made him and intended him to live become forward. And we talk for the next 20, 30 minutes. And then he says, all right, man, I got to go, man. I was like, what's going on? He's like, "Uh, I I, I got a business appointment. And at this time, I already found out he was a drug dealer. I was like, a business appointment? Bro, you're about to go ruin someone's life. I'm like, you come back here after you're done with that. I'm going to tell you more about Jesus. He says, yes, sir. (laughs) I love, sometimes there's a grace of God in evangelism because we're Christ's ambassadors, a grace sometimes to be forthright and to exercise our authority in an unnatural way that would otherwise be deemed antisocial. But sometimes there's a grace, sometimes there's a grace to tell it like it is. So homeboy comes back and we pray and we talk for another 20 minutes. Now this is when the high school students let out and they come up, they're like, hey, who are you talking to? 
who are you talking to? And I was like, my name's Adam. I want to talk to you all too. Why don't you come over here? I got something to say. I love this because, again, I don't, I, it's like the grace of, be, of God be, as we embrace our ambassador idea. Sometimes we get to break the rules. And all of a sudden, I had a group of about a dozen young people around me. And they're like, what are y'all doing? Y'all praying? I'm like, yeah, we're praying to Jesus, and he's, he's alive, and he speaks to his kids today. And they're like, oh, what's that about? So like, Why don't you let us pray for you? Why don't you find out? So this group of girls stands in front of me. So we're going to bow our heads. We're going to ask Jesus to speak to us about you. And they're like, what are y'all going to do? Just call him up? I'm like, well, kind of, <laughs> you know. Like, so they're, they're kind of mocking us, you know. But again, we've embraced our identity as sheep who hear the shepherd's voice. How many of you know hearing God has more to do with God's nature and your identity than it has to do with your spiritual gifts? I'm a sheep who hear the shepherd's voice, the good news of the gospel. You don't have to be a prophet to hear the voice of God. You just have to be a sheep. Bah, come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and so they're like, they're like, well, what do you do? Call them up. I'm sure we bow our heads. There's four or five young ladies in front of me. All of a sudden, God downloads these images. I, I see that all of y'all are dancers. God's made you all to dance before him for his glory, not to dance in a way that brings attention to yourself. All of a sudden, jaw dropped. I love, you know, I love, I love non-church, non-believers when they get a word of knowledge. Because in the church, it's different. I, somebody could, Sean Balls could come in here and tell you your address, your last name, the name of your, your dead bird, and you'd be like, one single teardrop. Oh, amen, brother, you know? <laughs> But on the streets, on the street at McDonald's at 3 p.m., they get their mail read. They're like, oh! They're like, yeah, we're, we all literally just came from dance practice. We're all on the same dance team. And all the friends now drew a bigger crowd. And the girls are out there, oh, Jesus said we a dancer, you know. And the, next fo- <laughs> the next girl comes up. The next girl comes up, bow her heads, boom, image comes. I see a young man, he's 20 years old, and he's behind bars, and you've been praying for him and filled with anxiety for two years. Who is this? She begins to weep. She says, that's my brother. He's been in jail for the last two years. Why would God show you that about me? Because God loves you so much. He, you can't do anything for him, but pray for him. God wants to set you free, though, of your anxiety and your fear. He's not designed you to live that way, honey. Come on, how awesome this is. Next, next, lady, next young lady comes up in line. And she's like, oh, what you going to do? Call God. They all, they're all mocking me. What are you going to do? Call God up. Their friends are crying behind them. They keep mocking me. And our team, and we're like, well, let's call them up right now. <laughs> and then, boom, immediately I point to her and said, God says that you're a fighter. And you're such a warrior and a fighter that the last two weeks you've been having dreams every night about fighting someone. And you've been waking up thinking about what do these dreams mean? Her jaw dropped. She said, I was just in the restaurant, and I told my friends that I, was, I had been having these dreams every night about fighting other people, and I'm asking them, what does it mean? She came outside McDonald's, and all of a sudden the prayer team tells her, you're a fighter, and your dreams mean that you were made to fight battles in the spirit, and you're not alone. God's, God wants to be with you in your fighting. She begins to cry, and we, man, I'll tell you what, it just, it, it was like we, all of a sudden we had two ministry lines outside of McDonald's, that ran the full length of the McDonald's. We had conference-level ministry that were happening outside McDonald's. People were driving by McDonald's like, what's going on over there? Like, lines of kids getting blasted by God. I love the prophetic because it's like, it's like practical theology. Like when a word of knowledge comes, it expresses something of God's eternal nature. He is omniscient. He knows everything. And it says more than his omniscience. It says that God loves you enough to speak to the perfect stranger the secrets of your heart. It was so powerful. So many kids got saved that afternoon. That McDonald's about came, became a Chick-fil-A. <laughs> that joke works in Roseville. Note to self. <laughs> Five years later, I was in Ireland this, this, last, this, this year. Four or five years later, in, in February of this year, and we were in uh, Dublin, Ireland, doing a conference, an equipping conference for a church. And at the end of the conference, um, you know, uh, uh, our driver host says, oh, man, I know you guys need to get food. You know, I know you're hungry. You've been ministering all day. 
He said, the only place that's open right now near the hotel is McDonald's. And so I, I understand this is California. Don't fat shame me, okay? Don't just, okay? This is a judgment-free zone, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm like, just take, take us to McDonald's. God will bless it, you know? And so we were tired. We had prayed for hours. We had, we had taught for hours. We show up at McDonald's. I walk in, and I see a group of high school students to my right. And I immediately have a flashback of the last time I went to McDonald's five years ago when we were outside ministering, you know? And... Uh, And I was so tired. You know what I said to the Lord? I said, no, God. (laughs) You ever prayed a prayer like that? (laughs) No, Lord. I'm tired. I'm tired, Lord. And so I I order my food. And I, instead of going sit next to these high school kids, I went and sat on the other end of the McDonald's restaurant, sat by myself. I'm going to eat my quarter pounder with cheese. I'm going to have my two salty fries, my Diet Coke. I want to wake up dehydrated. I want to do it again, you know? (laughs) And that's what I want to do. And so there I am. I'm sitting down like, Lord, please, I don't want to have. How many of you know, first point, when you embrace your identity as an ambassador of Christ, all of a sudden your schedule becomes a target for divine interruption. When you embrace your identity as an ambassador, your your schedule becomes a target for divine interruption. You are not Lord over your schedule. Jesus is Lord over your schedule. And you might have a plan. You might have something in your eye calendar. But God has ordained from the foundation of time for you to walk in good works that he's prepared for you to, in advance to walk in. You are God's workmanship in Christ Jesus. That's your identity. Come on, say amen. So you know what happened? I'm sitting there opening my quarter pounder of cheese. I take one bite. I'm like, no, Lord, don't make me do anything, God. I just want to eat this thing and go home, Lord. Take one bite. And a Nigerian Dubliner 18-year-old kid comes over. He sits right next to me. He puts his arm around me. And he's like, oh, you're a Christian. You're a Christian, aren't you? He says, how about you pray for me right now? Put your hand on my forehead and pray for me right now. He's mocking me. I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. (laughs) When you embrace your identity as an ambassador, your schedule becomes a target for divine interruption. Here's what happened is one of our teammates, a female, walks into a restroom and two Irish girls follow her and they're, they're using the restroom. Two Irish teenage boys walk into that same female restroom. They didn't know we had a staff member in there. They come in. Who knows what's about to go down? But our girl Amy, Mama Bear Spirit, goes, what are you doing in here? And the dudes are like, ah! You know, they run out. So Amy runs, and she walks out after them, and she, and she engages them. She tells them who we are. Someone finds out that I'm a pastor, a preacher, yada, yada. He gets up, and he walks over to the other side of the restaurant. He says, oh, you're a Christian. Pray for me then. Pray for me then. And he's mocking me. And I said, okay, well, I don't want to pray for you. I'm not going to lay hands on you. But we want God to come and tell you who you really are. His, all of a sudden, we have a group of 12 now that are around us. What are you going to do? This is always the mocking, what are you going to do, call God up? <laughs> it's like, it's an international thing, you know? <laughs> and we bow our heads. God begins to speak to this young man. He says, everything you're saying makes me feel good inside, and it feels true. Then he says this. He says, I believe in Jesus. I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> I'm eating my burger. He's like, I believe in Jesus, but I'm not surrendered to him. I'm like, then you don't believe, dog. You know, and so he, we're going back and forth, and he's like, I believe in Jesus. I don't surrender to him because I, I have one sin that I'm holding on to. Here's my plan. He says, my plan is that I'm going to become successful in, in business, and then once I'm successful, I'm going I'm gonna, to I'm gonna give him this sin. I was so tired in the moment. I'm eating my burger. I just looked at him. All these kids are around, you know. Like I, I'm like, you're a fool. <laughs> and I kept eating. <laughs> I'm like, Lord, you better be able to use that, you know. God uses the foolish things of the world, right? <laughs> I'm like, you're a fool, man. All of a sudden, they're like, oh, what's good? What are you doing? And, and I'm like, you're, listen, listen, you're a fool if you think you're going to hold on to sin and it won't, sin won't destroy you. Sometimes there's a grace in evangelism. I'm not giving you permission to be a jerk, but sometimes there's a grace in evangelism to, to tell it like it is. All of a sudden, the volume gets turned up in the restaurant. There's about 15 kids around us. They're hooting and hollering. The conversation's getting out of hand. It's going nowhere. The gospel encounter is not really making an impact. So I'm like, Lord, help. God, give us something that would break through their hearts. Because the prophetic wasn't breaking through. And 
And the cool thing about evangelism with God is, you know, we have to follow him. And we don't always get the same results by taking the same approach in every time. So I'm like, Lord, give us a breakthrough. Here's, what I, here's the idea that pops in my mind, and I said this out loud. I said, as the volume's getting turned up, I shouted. I said, my dad left me when I was three years old. And you could have heard a pin drop. He left my mom, my three sisters, and myself. He never once paid child support or supported us financially. Because he abandoned his role in my life as a dad, we lived in poverty and gang violence. I experienced physical and sexual abuse because he was outside of my home. I said, don't tell me that you're going to hold on to sin and it won't destroy you and those you love. Because my dad's sin brought destruction to my own life. And it was about this quiet. And the young lady across from me says, my dad left too. And the young man across from her said, my dad left too. And the young man across from him said, my dad left too. And one more young lady said, my dad left too. What's fascinating is in that moment, it wasn't a prophetic word that broke through the moment. It was actually the language of pain. It wasn't the language of prophecy. It was the language of pain that this generation is all too familiar with. And when I began to hear God, and I began to let, let down my guard, just say, man, my dad left me and it caused destruction in my life. Everyone, the fatherless gen generation inside that McDonald's could identify with it. In that moment, we were able to convey the love of God to these ones before they all got in their car and they drove away. And I walked away thinking, Lord, change my heart. I want to be your ambassador. I want God, my, um, I want to give you permission again for my target, my schedule to become a target for divine interruptions. The second thing I want to say to you right now is that when we embrace our identity as an ambassador, we carry a message of reconciliation. This idea that God is giving, has get, speaking through us this message of reconciliation, this message that's saying to humanity, I want restored intimacy with you. I want to restore connection with you. I want to bring you back into the family and, and, and my, my household. This is the cry of God. This is why Paul said, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. This idea that sometimes in evangelism, there's a plea going forth. Please give your heart to Jesus. Know him. Love him. Receive from him. And that's how it felt there, even in Ireland on that evening. Perhaps no one more so in Scripture in the New Testament do we see uh, embracing their identity as Christ's ambassador than the Apostle Paul himself. In Philippians chapter 1. Verses 12 to 2, we have insight into Paul's life as an ambassador. A little context here. Paul was on house arrest in Rome for preaching the gospel. Come on, if you've ever been incarcerated or on probation, you're, on, you're in good company. Because one of the authors of the New Testament wore an ankle bracelet for two years. Say amen, someone. It's not a joke. That's real talk. And he's writing this letters to a church that he founded years before who are concerned about his well-being because he's imprisoned in Rome. They're thinking he's going to die. And he's actually writing to comfort them. And he's saying, actually, the circumstance I'm in, as, as, as weak and as broken as it seems, is actually serving to advance the gospel. This is good news for every one of us here who find ourselves in a season of limitation or a season of weakness or a season where we feel like we might be disqualified from being an ambassador of Christ because our life circumstances seem to be that, that, that look like bondage instead of that that look like freedom. While in bondage to Rome, Paul writes these words, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. He says, so that it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. You can leave that up there. What is the imperial guard? You read some history, you find out that the imperial guard were the 300 most elite Roman soldiers. They actually were the, high, they're the trained Navy SEALs of their day. Furthermore, they were the next generation political leaders of the Roman Empire. And they were the task force that was assigned to watch over the Apostle Paul during his imprisonment and his house arrest in Rome. 
Come on, how did God choose to invade the Roman world with the gospel? He took his best missionary and he says, I'm going to put you, I'm going to corner you in a limitation, in a circumstance that makes you feel like you're going nowhere. And just when you feel like you're going nowhere, I, that will be my very plan and purpose to turn this Roman world upside down with the gospel. And friends, this is good news for everyone here who feels like their life is limited by an unfortunate circumstance. Your life is limited by some type of struggle. Your life is limited by some type of financial circumstance. God is able to use you right where you're at. And when you embrace your identity as an ambassador because your circumstances don't get to determine God's, God's well, will and purpose for your life. No, your identity speaks who and informs your, your, your calling and your purpose. He says, most of the brothers have become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, and they're much more bold to speak the gospel even without fear. Paul's limitation became the very platform through which God would invade the Roman world with the gospel. What if? The limitation you're facing today is the very weakness through which God is saying my grace is sufficient for you and my power is perfected in weakness. Don't run from your weakness because it doesn't disqualify you. It might actually be your asset because it attracts me to you, God says. It attracts my power to you because I want to demonstrate my greatness in your weak little life. Is this good? This is good news, friend. We tend to believe the lie that we just got to get it all cleaned up and get perfect before we start seeing eternal purpose being released through our lives. I'll tell you what, God can use a 17-year-old wannabe disciple, former drug marijuana pothead, and say, I'm going to use you to, <laughs> to use a Jesus rave in downtown Nashville. We're going to see 100 kids come to the Lord the first weeks that you're in Christ. Tradition and history tells us that the Imperial Guard would come in four hours at a shift. They'd at times chain themselves to Paul. How cool is that, right? And he's writing the prison epistles during this time. He's writing on these parchment papers. Can you imagine a Roman soldier over there going, what you writing over there, Paul? He's like, nothing, nothing, nothing. He's like, tell me what you're writing. He's like, it's, it's the Bible. You know, <laughs> he's like... <laughs> He's like, I'm kind of a big deal, you know. He's, he's writing. Four hours would go up, you know. All of a sudden, he'd, the Roman soldier would unshackle himself. He'd go and take a smoke break. He's unionized. Another worker would come in, and they'd chain themselves. Sorry. They'd chain themselves. Chain themselves. Chain themselves to Apostle Paul, and they'd have the same conversation. That's why Paul could say it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard that my chains are in Christ. You have no idea the domino effect that happens when you simply embrace your identity as an ambassador and love the one in front of you. You would think that to in, for the gospel to invade Rome, we would need a Billy Graham crusade our Reinhard Bonnke crusade and gather by the hundreds of thousands and preach the gospel with miracles and, and, and use trucks to take away the wheelchairs and, and all of that. You would think that God's plan for invading Rome with the gospel would be this large-scale, massive evangelism, business-oriented plan to see souls swept in the... No, he just needed one broken man who was willing to embrace his identity as an ambassador and willing to be limited by God in human weakness, that God's power could be perfected in the midst of his limitation. Will you embrace your identity as an ambassador and say yes to the weakness that is limiting you today and say yes to believing for God's power to be perfected right there where you're at? My mom embraced this, this identity truth, I think, when she first came to Christ, you know, as I wrap up here, you know, the end of the, my, my salvation story, it's so fun because my mom, we didn't grow up in the church. We were twice a year Catholic. 
wave your hand at me if you're twi- you were a twice a year Catholic. And, uh, and so we were a twice a year Catholic. My mom started receiving these, these experiences in the middle of the night where she started seeing demons. Not cool. <laughs> and they scared her so much she started going to church. <laughs> How many of you know the devil overplays his hand sometimes? He thinks he's cornered a woman in fear. and She's like, I'm going to church. He's like, no. <laughs> she shows up at the Vineyard Christian Fellowship of Salinas, California. During a time in the Vineyard Movement when the Holy Spirit was blowing in power, we went from twice a year Catholic to standing for an hour in a worship service before the preacher would say, an hour. People have hands raised. They're singing choruses, 20 choruses repeated in a row. <laughs> They're singing in languages we don't understand. Their hands are shaking. They're doing this. You know what I'm talking about? They're like shaking and dropping and rolling around and laughing. We're like, Mom joined a cult. You know, <laughs> like straight up, Mom joined a cult. Then my mom came to my, my bedside, uh, in my room one morning when I was just a young teenager, and she said, Mio, please don't play in tonight's football game. I said, you're crazy. Why? She said, well, I had a dream. God showed me something. I think something bad's going to happen to you. I'm like, Mom, you're crazy. Keep your dreams to yourself. I'm playing in the game, biggest game of the year. She goes and picks up the phone and calls all her friends from church. Pray with me tonight for my son Adam that he would live and not die. God came to me in a dream and asked me to pray that he would live and not die. I'm like, Mom, you didn't tell me that part. <laughs> She's like, Mijo, would it change nothing? I said, no. <laughs> and so I played in the game, but in the third quarter of the game, I collapsed on the field. I begin vomiting, and I begin having seizures. The last thing I remember were hearing sirens, and I blacked out. I was rushed to the hospital where I underwent three and a half hours of emergency brain surgery because of a blood clot on my brain due to the fo- a fo- a injury sustained in the football game. I should have died on the field just like a young man did the following year in my hometown on the practice field with the same injury. But my mom was forewarned in a dream with the prayer of intercession to pray that I would live and not die. So having been forewarned by the Lord, she could enter into a moment of crisis, and instead of her faith being shook, she shook the crisis with her faith. So I'm telling you, when you... Everything changes when you let God define you. Here's a single mama facing a moment of crisis, and she entered into the crisis forewarned by the Lord as an ambassador, and she began to pray the prayer God gave her. She started a prayer meeting on the ground, the same turf that I was seizing on, and she dragged parents down with her. How many of you know when a little Latina mama says, you about to pray? You're going to pray in Jesus' name. It doesn't matter if you're, it doesn't matter if you are Buddhist or Muslim, you're about to be praying to Jesus right now. You might be Baptist or Presbyterian, but you're about to be praying in tongues, making stuff up, shabba keys to the Honda, Domino's pizza, all of that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm here today because of the mercy of God and my mom's intercession. Because a woman, a single mom, who left her home when she was 16 years old, a two-bedroom project apartment in the heart of Salinas, California. She left her home, a home that was filled with physical, sexual abuse, the same abandonment that I experienced, she experienced. How many of you know it's generational? She left her home at 16 years old, finished her high school career, started making babies, Four children later, and there she is. But she embraced who she was. Now now even her greatest moments of weakness could be filled with the power of God and be turning points in the life of her family. My My four little ones, two girls, two boys, they're the first kids in three genera- two generations, three generations on my mom's side, my dad's side that are growing up with Christ in the home from the beginning. They're the first kids that won't know poverty, won't know divorce in the grace of God, won't know physical or sexual abuse in the home. Everything changes. Jesus changes everything. 
Oh, church, Rock of Roseville, would you let him define you? Would you let him tell you who you really are today? Yes, receive this truth. You're an ambassador of Christ. Yes, receive this truth that you're God's workmanship, prepared for good works. Yes, receive this truth that you're a sheep who's made to hear the shepherd's voice. When you let God tell you who you are, it informs how you live. And everything changes. Would you stand to your feet with me, please? We want to respond to the Lord with a, a, a chorus here and a song. Then we'll just have a time of response and ministry. Thank you, Jesus.